Hi there, it's Dr. Bernstein and in this video, the first of two installments on Ann Bradstreet, I'm going to provide you with some important background information on the publication history surrounding Bradstreet's first book of poetry and start guiding you into the process of analyzing one of her most well-known poems, the author to her book. So Bradstreet's The Tenth Muse lately sprung up in America, her first book of poetry, was published in 1650 without her knowledge or permission, and it was the first published book of poetry written by someone living in the colonies. Now the title of her book is interesting and significant, and a lot of times people don't think about this, but Bradstreet did not come up with the title. Her brother-in-law, John Woodbridge, did, and he was the one who got her work published, who took it and to a publisher and got it printed up. And Charlotte Gordon, who's one of Bradstreet's biographers, suggests that it was easier for men, like John Woodbridge, to envision a woman as an inspiration or a muse of poetry than as an author. So the very title of the work, the first thing that most people see, doesn't really give Bradstreet credit as an author in her own right. Um, so somehow Woodbridge was positioning her as a muse, as a creative inspiration to others rather than a creator herself. And you should keep this issue of the muse in mind when reading Bradstreet's The Prologue because she touches on issues related to muses in there. I also want to call attention to the fact that Woodbridge, who was a pastor, felt compelled to preface her book of poetry with an introduction because he thought people might not believe the poetry was actually written by her, and if they did believe she wrote it, they might, in his mind, be suspicious of her and perhaps imagine that she was not fulfilling her role as a woman and mother. So, as Gordon points out in her biography, when Woodbridge got to London, he went around collecting testimonials from men with, you know, good reputations and got them to attest to Bradstreet's merits as a writer and as a pious Puritan. He also gathered, um, this is a direct quote from Gordon, he also gathered 12 pages of prefatory poems by well-respected pious men to supplement the manuscript and testify to her faithfulness and modesty. I mention this because um, similar types of prefaces or introductions, ones that really were sort of very involved in emphasizing the credibility of the author, appeared in the works of other women. So, um, for instance, Mary Rowlandson's Captivity Narrative, which was also published in the 17th century, um, and which is in the Norton Anthology of American Literature, if that's the text that you're using for your course, um, was also prefaced in a similar manner. And then in the 19th century, you'll also notice that slave narratives, like the one that Frederick Douglass wrote, also had prefaces, in this case by white men, um, who were attesting to the quality of his character and intelligence. Um, so it's like this frame, these, these introductions are sort of frame narratives that help people take the author seriously. What I want us to do right now is take a quick look at an excerpt from Woodbridge's own preface to Bradstreet's book of poetry. Woodbridge writes, It is the work of a woman, honored and esteemed where she lives, for her gracious demeanor, her eminent parts, her pious conversation, her courteous disposition, her exact diligence in her place, and discreet managing of her family occasions. And more than so, these poems are the fruit but of some few hours curtailed from her sleep and other refreshments. Contrary to her, meaning Bradstreet's expectation, I have presumed to bring to public view what she resolved should never in such a manner see the sun, but I found that diverse had gotten some scattered papers, affected them well, were likely to have sent forth broken feet pieces to the author's prejudice, which I thought to prevent, as well as to pleasure those that earnestly desired the view of the whole." So let's just um, think about this here. 
he's clearly emphasizing how Bradstreet knows and keeps her place as a woman. So this is this is apparently something that's making people anxious. This idea that well, a female writer might. Um, neglect her duties, neglect the family in order to do her work. So he's addressing these concerns. Um, he emphasizes again how she fulfills her duty duties as a wife and mother and doesn't take time away from them in order to engage in her creative work. This issue of keeping her place, of you know, fulfilling her role as a woman is something that you should keep in mind when you're reading the prologue as well. And Woodbridge also emphasizes how Bradstreet wanted to keep her poetry private and claims responsibility for her work, for bringing her work into the public eye. So it's not that she's some aggressive woman, right, stereotype of uh, in, sort of an aggressive woman. No, rather it, he's emphasizing that she didn't even want this work published in the first place or wasn't intending for it to be published. Now what's also interesting is that he included his own poem in the preface. Um, I'm always sort of intrigued by why he decided to have other people include their own poems in here and include his own poem in her book of poetry. Uh, that's something that's worth contemplating. I don't think we can find a definitive answer to it, but I think it's um, an interesting <laughs> inclusion. So this is the poem that Woodbridge wrote and included in his preface to Bradstreet's book. He writes, If you shall think it will be to your shame to be in print that I must bear the blame. If it be a fault, tis mine to shame that might deny so fair an infant of its right. To look abroad, I know your modest mind. How you will blush, complain, tis too unkind. To force a woman's birth, provoke her pain, expose her labors to the world's disdain. I know you'll say you do defy that meant that stamped you thus to be a fool in print. <laughs> so um, I use boldface to call attention, to call more attention to the multiple references to birthing in his poem. Now obviously to bear means to bear the burden of something, to carry the burden of something. And he says he will bear responsibility for any shame or fault associated with the publication of this work. But to bear also refers to giving birth to something. And um, just a few lines later, he's introducing the concept of the book as an infant and then taking ownership of the birth of her work. He's forcing its birth by getting it published. There's something violent about this. Now, interestingly, she's no longer responsible for birthing her poetry. For him, the, 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 the pain and the birth are associated with the act of publication rather than with the, with the act of writing, with the creative act itself. And I bring all this up because um, Bradstreet wrote the author to her book, what um, when a second edition of her book of poetry was coming out and in many ways her poem is a response to Woodbridge's preface and this poem that I just read to you. So um, if you've already read the author to her book this video should open your eyes to a new way of understanding the poem and if you uh, haven't yet read the poem, you should do so now and then come check out the second installment in this series on Bradstreet's poetry uh, where I'll talk to you in greater detail about the author to her work. So that's it for now. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment box below. Any feedback you'd like to share would be great. So that's it for now. Take care. Bye-bye.